All right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Tobias Leendok here. I work for a company called Neo4j. We build a uh, graph database management system, and we build it using Java. And in a prior life, I um, used to work on creating, um, on implementing a, um, a dynamic language for the JVM called uh, Jython, uh, so Python for the JVM. So throughout the years, I've um, and still uh, encounter a few, um, come across a few interesting things that you can do with uh, with the JVM and bend it in a few uh, ways that uh, uh, that are fun and interesting. Um, so I thought I'd uh, on, on a, <coughs> a few times uh, before, and I thought now again I'll do um, do a talk in, and share. Um, some of those things. So um, this is talk about um, hacking the JVM and doing it mostly from, from pure Java code. Um, so most of you are probably thinking about this guy, SunMisk Unsafe. Um, and you probably know about it, so it's boring. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, in fact, most of it is, uh, most of the behavior here is uh, made completely safe and available by other APIs these days. Um, so it's not very interesting anymore. Uh, the only remaining thing, of course, is uh, um, a good API for native memory access, but hopefully that will be coming any given future now. So I'm going to talk about other things instead. So let's talk about, start with something that is uh, public and not uh, uh, secret in any way. Um, the thread MX beam has a... Um, uh, CPU time method that gives you the um, time that a uh, the time as, that the the thread uh, that you specify as a, using the thread ID um, the amount of time that uh, that thread has spent actively executing on the CPU. This is really useful for being able to measure how much your application is actually um, executing versus um, <coughs> being swapped out and idle in some way for, for doing performance measurements um, on a different level than what you can do with uh, system nano time. So sure, you, you're getting uh, uh, system nano time is very good for measuring um, how much wall time is being spent, but you might also be interested in looking at um, how much time is um, uh, did that code spend actually ac actively executing uh, and not just being swapped out. Um, this um, thread MX bean ha uh, has, a, uh, has a sibling or child or bastard hidden uh, friend um, that's also called thread MX bean, uh, but in a different package in uh, Comsun management. So this is actually another interface that the same on hotspot, the same uh, actual instance also implements. Uh, and here you've got uh, another interesting uh, method for getting the allocated bytes by a thread. This is also super useful uh, for measuring how much, uh, how many bytes, how much data, uh, how much memory has been allocated by a particular piece of code. So you take a uh, snapshot of this before your card code starts executing, take a snapshot after afterwards, and then you uh, compare the difference um, and compute the difference. And that that will tell you how much data was being uh, allocated by this particular um, code that was being executed. Uh, sure, it doesn't tell you how many objects were executed, but the number of bytes is a, uh, a really interesting measure because um, that'll um, that will tell you uh, essentially how much um, pressure the allocator and garbage collector will be under. Unfortunately. This method has a problem. Uh, first of all, obviously, it's not a public API, so it's not officially supported. Uh, so I'd love it if it, if it could be. Uh, and in the process of making it officially supported, I'd love it if it also um, didn't require acquiring a uh, global lock in the implementation for uh, getting the um, allocated bytes for the current thread, uh, which technically it shouldn't need to. But the use cases haven't been there, so uh, it, it, always, um, it always grabs that lock. Uh, which means that even though we, we use this in uh, Neo4j, you can turn um, 
turn tracing of uh, allocation on for, uh, for your queries when you run queries for a database um, and get information about uh, this much data was allocated while your query ran. Uh, but it unfortunately leads to contention, so it's turned off by default. Uh, there's um, another interesting API that's available uh, in every uh, JVM. This is a public API um, called uh, uh, Instrumentation, Java Lang Instrument Instrumentation. Um, this is an API used by Java agents. It's typically used for uh, things like uh, registering bytecode transformers, which I'm sure people have interesting use cases for that. I've never really had a good use case for, for doing a uh, transformation of, um, of bytecode uh, in a running system. I prefer to do my transformation ahead of time. Um, but uh, and one reason for that is that it makes um, code loading much, much slower. But it also provides a, um, a handy um, method for getting object size. Um, give it an object, and it'll tell you how, how big it is. Uh, it's a size alpha for here, which, uh, which is uh, missing otherwise in, in Java. Um, the, um, uh, the main downside of, um, of uh, using the instrumentation API, if you, if you want to get access to the get object size method, is that it's a bit tricky to get to. The only things that, actually, uh, that get access to, um, uh, to, instrument, to the instrumentation API are Java agents. Um, so you have to write an agent in order to look at object size. That's, that's annoying. Um, luckily, you can deploy uh, an agent from the same uh, JVM into the same JVM while it's running, um, and then uh, via a static field somewhere, uh, give yourself give yourself access to um, to the instrumentation instance. So you simply write an agent class like this. Uh, I've compressed this heavily um, to fit it on two slides um, with an agent main that takes uh, takes the instrumentation uh, instance as um, as parameter, uh, that's the um, uh, method that will be invoked when uh, uh, when this uh, jar file runs as a um, uh, runs as an agent, uh, and then uh, puts that into a um, uh, into a field that we can read. So the uh, get instrumentation method will look at a field. If it's not uh, assigned, it'll uh, load it. To load the um, uh, load this class as an agent, uh, which will assign the field as we see in the uh, agent main method, uh, and then return it. So how does this loading work then? Well, this uses uh, a private API, um, the virtual machine attached API that's part of um, of the hotspot VM, um, which uh, allows you to get uh, to attach to a um, VM and tell that VM to load an agent. So here we get the PID of the current process uh, and um, load the agent of the current, uh, load the current jar as an agent in that uh, VM uh, and then fetch. That's all we need to do. Uh, the agent main method then will do the rest. Um, I'll skip that, that's not interesting. Um, but if, if, we wanted, if we were to think about how can we make the JVM better, uh, how can we make this easier, why do we really need to um, require an agent to get the instrumentation uh, class? Uh, sure, it has lots of uh, capabilities that should be declared in um, the agent jar. Um, so maybe, but maybe some of those um, capabilities, like get object size, doesn't need to be uh, reserved for agents. How about having a getter for instrumentation or a getter for some smaller API that pro uh, provides get object size? If we want to get even more powerful tools, there's um, we can write some C code uh, or some native code uh, using the JVM 
tooling interface, JVMTI. Um, so this is a um, native API for writing um, native uh, JVM agents. It's another type of agent, not a Java agent, but I think these are just called agents. Um, the interesting thing about this is that once you've, uh, even though this, is, uh, this API is meant to be used from uh, an agent, it's perfectly possible to write JNI code that calls it. Um, so we can do that. Uh, although you might still need an agent in order to, um, to enable certain, of, certain capabilities, um, because not all JVMTI capabilities are enabled by default, just like not all uh, instrumentation um, capabilities are enabled by default. And some of them cannot be enabled once the JVM has started running. They have to be enabled uh, before. Um, and at that point, they will probably, most likely, disable a few um, uh, of the optimizations that a JVM performs. Uh, so for, but if you want to play with them, um, uh, you need to, to have an agent to, uh, to enable those capabilities. I don't actually remember which capabilities uh, those are, because I wrote this code a couple years ago. Um, but once we've done that, we can play with, uh, with a lot of interesting uh, JVM introspection capabilities from pure Java code, uh, just calling through JNI to this native code. Uh, and, uh, that's actually quite simple and straightforward. We can do things like uh, reflecting a call stack. Uh, so getting the uh, stack of running Java code uh, and getting local variables out of, um, out of the calling method or interesting <laughs> things like that. So there's a, uh, a method in this uh, JVMTI uh, uh, API called uh, get stack uh, We can use that to get uh, the stack trace from a certain depth to, uh, and of a particular length uh, in number of frames. So we can say from depth zero and uh, guesstimate that the stack will be no bigger than 10 million or something like that, some big number. Um, and we'll get um, <coughs> we'll get a um, uh, we'll get the frame uh, information from uh, from all those frames and uh, and uh, a um, counter telling us exactly how deep the stack was. Or we can say I want either particular depth. I want just one stack frame because that's the frame I'm interested in. So this will give us um, this little struct of information containing. Um, the method ID, um, which is a JNI, uh, uh, JNI reference to, to a method. And uh, the current location, the current offset in the bytecode of that method that um, uh, where ex execution is currently at. Um, there's also a method for, um, for getting the frame code count, so we don't, don't actually have to, uh, to guess the depth of the, uh, uh, of the stack. We can, we can call this um, method to get the uh, actual frame count. Uh, and we can also use this method to, uh, the, the total frame count to convert the uh, depth at which we inspected a frame to a height from the bottom of the stack where it's at, um, which uh, which we, is useful if we want to do, um, if we want to reflect the frame, create a Java representation of the frame um, as an object, and have that be uh, sort of live, a live mirror to the uh, to the um, to the actual underlying frame. We have to have some way of detaching it, um, and in order to do that, we need to know uh, we need a fixed number of uh, the offset that, it, that it's at, because it's not always going to be at the same depth, but it's always going to be at the same height. So once we have this, um, uh, this, um, what was it called? Um, this frame info, um, we can then use, um, uh, uh, use the method ID to get the uh, variable table of, uh, of that method. Uh, that gives us um, another little array uh, of uh, structs um, that contain information about uh, 
what the uh, where in the method at which the bytecode offsets the um, uh, the variable is valid, what the name and signature of the variable is, and also which slot it's stored in. Um, this return table pointer needs to be deallocated, so uh, we need to use the deallocate uh, API once we're done with it. Uh, so now that we've um, uh, found our stack frame, uh, gotten the information about it, found the method that it's executing there, gotten the uh, local variable information for that method, uh, and found which slots the um, uh, which slot contains the particular uh, local variable by name um, that we're interested in. Uh, we can call the get local object or get local float or get local long uh, method to uh, to get the actual uh, value stored in um, uh, stored in that local variable. We can even set the local object. Uh, and as I mentioned, if we want to reflect this as a uh, as a Java object that uh, has a live um, uh, sort of live coupling to the um, uh, to the uh, uh, actual frame, uh, we need to be able to detach that, and we use uh, we can use the notify frame pop um, uh, method to um, uh, to be able to do that detaching. So we say we call notify frame pop. And say that when the um, frame that is currently at this given depth is um, popped from the stack, uh, so when the, when the, that method returns, um, call this uh, call my callback, my um, uh, frame pop callback, <coughs> and the frame uh, pop frame frame pop um, callback is registered. Uh, there's one global callback that you register for um, uh, uh, for your agent, and um, when that frame is called, you get a callback that tells you which uh, thread and which method, and if it was um, popped by exception or a normal return. So this allows us to introspect uh, by, by calling this from um, J and I. Uh, we can inspect uh, the frame of. Um, the call frames of uh, of regular uh, of any Java code from from regular Java code, which is pretty pretty neat. Another thing that um, is useful that JVM TI can provide is uh, the ability to uh, walk the heap. Um, this is pretty logical that this is a possibility to do because um, the JVM has to do this all the time. This is what garbage collection does. It walks the heap and um, typically marks objects for uh, collection or for uh, moving because they're uh, going to be um, uh, kept. Um, and even this ability is exposed through the JVMTI uh, interface, the ability to tag objects. Uh, so we have an API that allows us to uh, walk the heap and tag uh, objects that we think are interesting in the heap. So we can, for example, follow references from uh, a particular object. Um, Follow all the references um, uh, to other objects that it references, uh, or we can linearly scan the entire heap, um, both all objects and scan live objects. Um, we can uh, also uh, iterate through all. In, there are also APIs for iterating through all instances of a given class. So we can use that for uh, to create a Java API that allows us to um, uh, get a ref given a class, give all the give me all the reference, um, give me all instances of that class. Um, we would use the iterate uh, over instances of a class method in JVMTI for, for achieving this, um, and tell it to uh, iterate over all these uh, all instances of uh, this particular class. Um, and call this callback. What we'll do in this callback is simply just tag all the objects that we see. Uh, so an implementation like that. It's assign the tag pointer to uh, the tag that was specified. Um, then we use the get objects with tags method to uh, get uh, to get an array uh, containing all the objects that were tagged. 
which we can then turn into a Java array and return to, um, uh, to our Java code. We can do even more powerful um, things uh, that are similar to what uh, the um, get object size uh, did in, um, uh, in the instrumentation API by uh, getting the ret uh, retained size of an object. So the size of an object and all of um, the objects that it references by iterating through uh, using the um, iterates over object reachable from object um, method, which does what it says on a tin. Uh, it iterates over all objects reachable from a given object. Uh, it doesn't, uh, and gives you a callback for, for each of them. It doesn't um, give you a callback for the object that you start from. So we also have to use um, get object size on, um, on that object, which is also available as a JVMTI method. Um, in the uh, callback uh, function, we get, uh, we get the size uh, handed to us, so we actually don't have, need to, um, to invoke get object size for, for each um, visited uh, object. But instead, what we do is just um, take that size and sum it up into the uh, user data field or the user data pointer. And that was it. That was a short overview of, of things that I wanted to, uh, to share that you can do with hidden APIs, uh, not very frequently used, in the, uh, but that are available in, uh, in pretty much any JVM.